natural resource meeting to order of this session. Uh, at this time, we need to do what's most important. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this beautiful day. Dear Heavenly Father, we just ask you to watch over our families as we are away from them. Dear Heavenly Father, just use us in any way you see fit to glorify you today. Dear Lord, give us the wisdom and knowledge to make the right decisions for the great people of the great state of Georgia. We love you and we need you. Forgive us our sins and thank you for wonderful blessings. In your name's sake, amen. All right. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Let's do a little butter in there. Good morning. Good morning. All right. All right, today, the first thing we got to do is uh, uh, adopt the rules. Everybody's got a copy of the rules in your folder. I'll give you a second to look at them. Actually, I gave you four seconds. Now, do I have a motion to approve the rules? Second. We got a motion and a second. All in favor, raise your right hand. All opposed, raise your right hand. It carries. So we have a set of rules now. Thank you all. All right, today we got a little presentation, a 10-minute presentation uh, from... Um, from what's what is, the, what is the names? Hold on, just a second. Watershed Kenny and Mike, <laughs> step up to the state. You, go to the microphone. State your name and what company you with, and you got ten minutes. Good morning, everybody. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Committee, for the invite to speak today. I'm Mike Ayers, one of the founders of Watershed Geo. We're an infrastructure company, primarily involved in environmental infrastructure, civil levees and dams, protecting safe dams here in Georgia and around the country. And primarily what we're talking about today are solar energy projects. There's a massive expansion of rural areas that are being hit with solar farms. They have shown by many reports to create significant erosion issues, significant water quality issues. What we have as an innovation company, a solution for that taking land, which Kenny, my colleague here, will go through various aspects of uh, redeveloping environmentally impaired sites, coal ash sites is a big um, opportunity to provide a much better environmental solution uh, using land that doesn't have any other real purpose um, and take those liabilities and turn them into a performing asset. So we'll go through that. Um, if, if you will, we'll go through the presentation. Love to answer all your questions at the end and get through some of the points I think we'll address along the way. So, okay. thank you. Thank you, Mike. One of the things that we looked at is a, a, a situation in Covington, Georgia. This is a landfill that we closed for Newton County. And we just want to say, you know, what if? What if we could power 800 homes from this landfill? What if we could save 20,000 or 20 plus acres and put uh, and, and redevelop this liability and turn it into an energy asset. What if we could save over 8,000 trucks of good land, good soil needed to come in and cover this landfill? What if we could reduce the carbon footprint by 80 percent? What if we could turn the taxpayer's money in maintenance of having to uh, uh, come in and cut vegetation, take care of a vegetated cap, and turn it in and save in, in thousands of dollars in maintenance. And what if we could turn this into a four megawatt generating plant? Again, four megawatts, roughly 800 homes that we could be able to, uh, to power from this. More importantly, what if we could, could save the 7,000 miles of rivers that we have throughout Georgia? What if we could, you know, there's, there's eight million acres of, of land that we use for agriculture here in the state. What if we could stop the, the water runoff that comes from this? One of the things that happens in solar uh, facilities is when they come in and disturb the land, you have water runoff that, that happens. Right here you see a picture, you see a clean water runoff. We look at turbidity, that's about 10 turbidities or NTUs that we're using here. Very clean water runoff that comes from uh, from our system. 
What we can do, because we're using an engineered turf, we can come in and put solar panels on top of it and not have to deal with the vegetation that typically grows on top of these panels and shades these panels. So we're able to put more panels on this acreage than we typically would with a traditional uh, vegetative cover. To give you an idea of what we're talking about here, we only need about two acres per megawatt. Compare that to six acres for a traditional situation. So you have to take up six acres per megawatt with the vegetative cover. With our system, we only need two. When we look at the installations that we already have in Georgia, we have uh, 10 that we've, we've already covered. Eight of those are in rural areas where you have, um, where, where the power is coming in, some from Georgia Power, but also that power is coming in from EMCs. From these cooperatives, with the Inflation Reduction Act, there's a way that these cooperatives can turn these assets into a, 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 a energy producing um, asset and, and be able to come in and pull tax credits from the IRA. The way these tax credits work for the EMCs is that they get a 30% tax credit for coming in with, uh, as a base uh, inflation, uh, uh, as a base tax credit. Then you also get a 10% for using domestic content and another 10% for going onto a brownfield. So a total potential tax credit is roughly 50% that would pay for the solar asset that we're putting onto these, uh, to these landfills. The other thing that, that I mentioned there was domestic tax credit. One of the things that we do with Watershed Geo is we try to utilize Georgia-based companies. We happen to be owned by Shaw. Shaw Industry manufactures our, our engineered turf that, that we put down onto the system. We also utilize south wire that would make the wire and the conductors that, that are, are uh, used to move the electrons back and forth. And then the other company we use is Hanwha Q-Cells, which, as you know, is just, has built a plant up in Dalton, Georgia, and now is building a plant in Cartersville, Georgia. So we try to use as many um, Georgia-based companies as we can. Now, there's two other landfills I haven't brought up, and these are owned by Georgia Power. These are coal combustible residual or ash ponds that have been closed with our systems. The nice thing is, is that they don't have to bring in that dirt that I talked about. By the way, to close one of these ash ponds, you need 18 inches of soil plus another six inches. That's a lot of good dirt being put onto these ash ponds. If we close in place, we can turn these ash ponds to another energy resource that is available to, to the Georgia taxpayers. Here's just a shot of, of a CCR that we did for, that we're working with TVA. Oh, hold a second. Yes, sir. Senator, Senator James, come on in, come on in. Continue, sir. Well, thank you very much. And, and this is great just to take for us just to take a break and look at one of the big things that we're talking about that we're that Watershed Geo is already working with the Tennessee Valley Authority on, and that is closing of, of an ash pond up in Paducah, Paducah, Kentucky. One of the reasons TVA went with our system of the engineered turf with the power cap system on top of it was saving a thousand acres of land. Remember, 
I, I said that it takes about six acres per megawatt with the vegetated cover. You also have to have other acreage going around that site to kind of give a buffer. So the way utilities look at it a lot of times is they'll go up to, to as much as 10 acres per megawatt needed. With the, this, we took this site, which is roughly 200 acres of usable space, and we were able to put a, 100 megawatts onto this site, or in, in, we're working on that right now to, to work on this project. The main thing that, that TVA looked at was not only the acreage that they were using, but the amount of truck traffic needed to come in and bring in that soil that we discussed earlier. It was thousands and thousands and thousands of good soil that was going to have to be put onto this impoundment. And then the other thing that, we, that, that was a key component was, as you notice, it runs up against uh, the river and the soil, the runoff that would, would be there. They liked our system because they knew that they would have clean water runoff when it rained, as opposed to that previous picture where I saw that had so much soil running off into the, the, um, the waterways. So I'll stop there and see if there's any questions that you may have about watershed geo and a, a way to come in and put put solar on top of these what considered a liability and turning these liabilities to an energy producing asset. Any question? What number are you sent to steal? Three. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, with the Paducah site, so by putting the artificial turf over it and then putting the solar farm on top, did you clean out the coal ash pond or did you just cap it and then what's the long-term residual of that? So yes sir, this, this is closed in place. So we came in with a geosynthetic membrane and then put our engineered turf on top of that. So the way that the system works for closure turf is that the, the membrane closes the impoundment and makes sure that there's no water that gets into the ash. Then the turf goes on top of that and protects that geomembrane and then the solar panels sit on top of the turf. I understand that. I guess my question is, but the slurry is still there. It's been dewatered, and then it's dried and, and then capped. So what would be the long-term implications of that? Because at some point, 2050, whatever the lifespan is of that solar farm, that's going to have to get rolled up, and then the turf's going to have to be rolled up, and then you're going to still have to deal with the coal ash sometime after that? So there's, there's two, the, the way that the panels would work is that the panels would be removed. The panels can last anywhere between 40 and 50 years. Um, the turf itself can last 100 plus years. And then the panels are actually protecting the turf. You, you have two opportunities that can happen. The, um, you can remove the panels and remove the turf and harvest the ash if needed or you can just keep it in place, like I said, over a over hundred years is our lifespan that we're looking at. I, 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 I don't think I'm phrasing the question correctly. I guess I'm more worried about what's under it and what's the long-term implications of what's under it because you've capped it and you've not really dealt with removing it like as we're starting to see power companies do. TVA's been doing this, Duke, Georgia Power, Southern Company and other states. But if we're not addressing the coal pond, the coal ash pond, what what's happening to all of that debris, it just seems like we're it, it's, a, it's a great use for capping it, but are we doing anything to address the underlying issue? Yeah. No, that, that's a great question, and every site is a little bit different. So what you're referring to is a hydrogeologic situation. So once that's been resolved by hydrogeoengineers that look at water receptors, like the Ohio River here, um, then they make a decision, does it make sense to close in place? That's where our scope begins. So we're not involved below the ground. That's a separate technical approval, it goes through EPA, it goes through their standards. I think Georgia is one of the few states, there's three or four, that approve CCRs completely without going to the EPA. The rest of the country has to default to them, and I believe including Kentucky. So that's a hydrogeologic situation. You're exactly right. Some are near water bodies and receptors, maybe have that groundwater um, in the wells that show that needs to be removal, um, that is part of the process. What we see, majority of them, including sites in Georgia, the unlined 
sites are very adequate from a hydrogeologic standpoint. Not our scope, but once it's decided that's the case, because it's a major impact to remove the coal ash, and that's what we ask. Look at 56 years of trucks and the risk of hauling that through communities versus closing in place, where you can have a groundwater monitoring regime that if you get an indication, you still have me decades before it gets to a receptor. But that's, that's the kind of things that's looked at, and when it makes sense, it solves a lot of environmental impacts by closing with our engineered turf, which is a special polymer, looks like a sports turf, but as Kenny mentioned, it lasts well over 100 years, and the membrane approved by the EPA lasts hundreds of years. So we've proven to EPA that we exceed their regulations. We're accepted in Georgia that we meet and exceed the regulations for landfills and has waste sites. So it's the same cross-section, better performance. But again, that comes in place after it's determined the hydrogeological regime, regime underneath. Thank you. So. Uh, any other questions? Just one quick question. What number are you? Number six. six. Thank you, Mr. Oh, Chairman. Um, two questions is what, I guess, is there a minimal, you know, square acre size or anything that y'all look at when you try to do one of these types of projects in terms of, you know, numbers of acres or what, what qualifies and what doesn't qualify? You know, for example, if you've got a retired landfill, whatever, sitting in a county that may be sitting on, I'm making up a number, you know, 200 acres versus one that's maybe county owned or something that might be 30 to 50 acres that's been sitting there for, 80 years and the community's trying to figure out what do we do with it we can't put a park on it we can't you know but is there an opportunity to do something you know with that what what does that look like we can talk offline too but what does that look like typically it, yeah there's that's great there's kind of two buckets that we look at right there's there's an municipal solid waste sites and cd C and D landfills that you have, typically those are smaller in scope. So we're looking like we did at Covington, anywhere between maybe four megawatts to up to 10 megawatts. What's unique about that, especially when we start looking at the tax credits, is that typically these areas are serviced by uh, our electrical electric cooperatives and in that they're able to monetize those tax credits to bring in solar into those sites now for the larger CCRs that we're showing here that that are utility owned those are those go into the utility scale solar so they they have a plant already there that they can utilize the electrons and put it right there at the plant that they are they've uh, retired so there's two buckets the nice thing is the economics really work out especially with the invest the uh, inflation reduction act bringing those tax credits to both a utility and an emc as well and what's the and i know it depends on the size and scope of the project but i mean what what is the typical cost or investment needed you know i mean like one of those kind of projects i mean what was you know what's the ballpark number for covington as a as an example if there's one yeah, yeah, so uh, there's a couple of ways. That, well, the total cost is uh, for the for the solar piece is roughly four million dollars. Now, the way that we offset that, I, you know, I talked about mm -hmm. tax credits. We can also come in and do a land lease that takes so that that municipal, municipality is leasing the land, and then we will develop the deal if, right. if needed. Makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you all for your presentation. Uh, this, this is the last question now. We got to, we got to move on. What number you do? I will. Uh, ten. Ten. Thank you very much, Mr. Right. Chairman. Uh, I'm trying to have an open mind about these landfills, uh, and and deal with the uh, I guess this new innovation. Uh, but the homes, these 800 homes. Tell me a little about. I'm really concerned about it because, like, when they close the base, like Fort Gillum and all these bases, and EPA comes out and say there's no contamination, uh, um, nothing has been done with, with the uh, ponds there, nobody fishing the pond, and we know that everybody's been fishing in the pond for 50 years. So uh, kind of tell me how this works. This is 800 homes you're talking about. Is this, are you trying to build on this or around it? Or tell me exactly what are you doing with this? 
so the the landfills the the landfills already there right uh -huh. and, it, it, and and you're exactly right it is a liability a lot of the liability comes in from the stormwater runoff getting into those ponds that, that people are fishing at exactly what you're you're saying the 800 homes that we're bringing up is just the amount of power that we could produce it's not that 800 homes are there we're saying that we can produce four megawatts worth of power that's roughly 800 homes that we could power in that area okay so that's where that number comes from but our system the the, the takeaway from our system is that we have that clean water runoff uh -huh. into those ponds that you're discussing so that you're not getting those contaminants into those ponds with our system okay thank you All right. thank you mr chairman thank you thank you for the presentation thank you and you got any questions in later maybe we can get up with you okay yes sir thank you thank you so much thank you all right, next we have uh, Senator James. We have just a hearing only on your bill, and we're going to uh, hold it to 10 minutes. See if you can you grab that one out. This one? Yeah. So, okay. grab, grab it. Go to the middle. Thank you so much. I think that's three. Chair and members of the committee. What number you do? Three. I am number three. Gotcha. Thank you for hearing this very important uh, piece of legislation. We tried, tried to move it many, many years, but last year, um, Oceana, the uh, Chattahoochee River Keepers, and many groups let me, let of me, the. Hold on just a second. Uh -huh. Senator. We, you're working off of LC510271? Yes. Um, let me see. Yes, 271. Okay, all right. Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Everybody has that? Mm -hmm. You want me to explain the bill first and then talk? Whatever how you want to do it, dude. you got <laughs> 10 minutes. Okay. Uh, let me just tell you that um, way back in 2000, um, I, I uh, was actually here and introduced a bill called Zero Waste by 2020, and that uh, bill was to uh, limit the amount of of, uh, of landfills by reducing the waste stream, by recycling, reducing, composting, covering up landfills, putting regulations on them. And we found out that the biggest problem we were having was that plastics are not, uh, does, don't disintegrate. They don't decay. And so they're, they're forever in the landfill. And then we realized that they were seeping into the water, the groundwater, and eventually make it into our uh, major waterways throughout Georgia. And we did more and more research and found out that even even uh, human beings uh, have about a um, credit card size uh, per year of ingested uh, plastic from the little plastic bags that you get in grocery stores or Walmart or those places, the, the little thin plastic. So we started doing even more research to see what we could do to uh, help our children and generations to come. Uh, plastics um, with Oceana uh, is working all over the United States. They even came here uh, last year and they've come and sent. I think you have a package full of things. And, and when we introduced it um, last year, uh, the only opposite, the ma major opposition was some grocery stores. But uh, since then, um, there are about 10 grocery chains uh, in Georgia that have uh, agreed to uh, phase out those plastic bags. And all these already phased them out and, and you have to get um, either buy a reusable bag or bring your own or use paper bags. And so they, they don't even uh, uh, issue them out or you can use one of the boxes so they, uh, they get the boxes after they stock the shelves and put them just like they do at, I think, BJ's and Sam's in a, in a cart, and you can uh, get your groceries from those boxes. 
So we're doing everything we can to reduce the waste stream and to take uh, plastics out of the uh, waste stream completely and out of our bodies and out of the waterways because in the waterways we found out that uh, the, the fish are ingesting them, the animals are ingesting them, and I have a lot of information that I've attached and sent to you. And I don't know if anyone had a chance to look at them, but I stop at this point. I had two people I thought were gonna come with me. And I guess eight o'clock was too early for them to get here. But they were coming from uh, out of town. So uh, I, I, I am uh, able to answer any questions and hope that we can find a way to eliminate, uh, at least start at the plastic, the thin plastic bags. Because I think it's a, a, a picture that's on the internet that I just saw in your package with me standing there holding. Right. Um, Everyone has it. Holding this picture, um, and this is a real picture of right at the Chattahoochee River and one of the waterways where it goes through. And you can see that it was obstructed by so many plastic bags. Uh, when I was the, um, the chairman of Keep South Fulton Beautiful, uh, we did an annual uh, ride down the hooch, is what we called it. And we went for four miles down the Chattahoochee River, and we had our red, our orange jackets on and our, our bags to collect trash. 90% of the things that we were collecting was plastic. And, and most of them were the plastic bags other than the basketball. We, we, we could have uh, started, started a, a store, a sports store with all the basketballs okay. that we were getting there. But, but um, th this is a threat. This is a threat to our bodies, to the animals. We're, and, and we're ingesting um, them again, not just from the air, but from the fish that we eat and the seafood that we eat because the small particles go into them and some of them don't die of it. So we catch them and we feed them when you go in your restaurants or in your own grocery, uh, a kitchen rather, you, you may be ingesting uh, something that could really harm you because just from the atmosphere you're getting, and this is, this is not my, uh, assumption this is a real fact that you get at least a credit card size uh, of it per year in your bodies so I uh, will stop here if it's okay, okay. Mr. Chairman That's fine. and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have any questions from the committee Senator again what number four four thank you Mr. Chairman yep. Senator James you brought this bill before said yeah. the uh and I, I'm always curious that you're, you're trying to uh, stop the, the usage, more usage of plastic bags. Correct. But in your, your legislation, uh, you, you keep referring to polystyrene foam. Your well, typical grocery store bag, you go to the uh, wherever, whatever, you know, uh, the, the different items that you list here, most of those are polyethylene. And, and I'm just kind of curious why you keep bringing a bill that, that is talking about a different material than, than what's commonly used in, it, in it's also in the plastic bags as well that's also in the plastic bags as well but um, many of, of the uh, people who have been working with me uh, are talking about styrofoam and other other things so that includes everything when when uh, we mentioned it in the bill it includes all of those uh, throwaway plastics thank you you're welcome any other questions? Mayor, none. Thank you for presenting your bill. Oh, okay. Well, um, thank you for listening, and I hope that this is something we could come back and actually have a vote on. Okay. I hope. So thank you very much, and uh, if you have any questions after today, I'll be happy to sit down and talk to you. I'll re refer you to some of the experts. Uh, who, and it's a vast number of people who want to do it. 
the grocery stores only say they don't want it because it costs too much. But it's being done in grocery stores already, and it's no dollar sign on our lives. So, uh, Chairman Anderson and members, thank you very much for listening to me this morning. And I hope that we can move this bill forward. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right. And I'll make some noise and leave you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. I'm trying yeah. to get this way. Get the door. Thank Are you. Are you going that way? Okay. Thank you. All right. We're going to go to the uh, next bill which is my bill, and I'm going to turn it over to the vice chairman, and I'll go to the platform. Okay. <laughs> Good morning, Senator Anderson. Good morning. <laughs> we have... Uh, What's that? Oh, he hadn't started yet. Um, I got to be careful here because he might boot me out of this chair. Um, so we're taking up Senate Bill 121, uh, version LC 510290. Um, Chairman Anderson, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, this is just a real simple bill. And this is a bill that where the great people, the great state of Georgia has the right to make that choice. And what it is, is if you own an acre or more, you have the right to drill a well. And that's basically what it is. Okay. Any questions from the committee? All right. Seeing so you no know questions, uh, we don't have anyone signed up to Mr. speak Chairman. for or against the bill. Yeah, Senator, again. Mr. What number Chairman, are you? Appropriate time, I'd like to move do pass on LC 510290. Okay. We, there's no other questions, comments. We have a motion to pass by Senator Ginn. Is there a second? Second. Second by Senator Goodman. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Uh, seven and no opposed. The chairman can, the, uh, he can vote since he's not presiding. He do you might want to vote. Do you want to vote? twice. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think uh, Senator Anderson needs a recount over there. <laughs> All right. So bill passes. Thank you, Senator Thank you. Anderson. Thank you. Meeting adjourned.